I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Christopher Weichart. Dr. Weichart has a PhD in chemical engineering, and he is currently chief scientist at SIO2, an advanced material science company that combines chemistry and engineering to create containers and surfaces for use by biotechnology, genomics, diagnostics, and consumer products companies of different kinds. One of their main focuses is actually creating a new kind of vaccine vial, which combines both glass and plastic to create a new kind of vial that is superior for storing and transporting biologics, biological materials, such as vaccines. SiO2 is currently producing an enormous number of these vials to be used for one of the new mRNA vaccines that's being used for COVID-19. And Chris described how these vials are actually made and what they're made of. And he also talked about what material science actually is and, and how important it actually is for many aspects of modern society. This conversation will also give you a sense for how some different parts of the COVID vaccine supply chain actually fit together that maybe you hadn't heard about before. I certainly didn't know how much of this worked, and it was fascinating to to learn about how, how all this stuff sort of happens behind the scenes. This episode is uh, sponsored by SIO2. Uh, for the new year in 2022, I will be doing uh, several sponsored episodes by different companies. These are typically going to be uh, science-related companies like biotechnology companies of different kinds, and this helps me support the podcast, keep it going, keep it growing. If you work for such a company or you know someone who works at an interesting company that's doing interesting, innovative scientific work, you can direct them to the contact page on my website, www.nickjacomas.com, and they can just shoot me a message there. Um, I don't necessarily select anyone who solicits, solicits me for this. It has to be uh, within the realm of what I normally discuss on the podcast, but anyone who's a, a scientist or founder at a science-related company that's doing interesting science work that wants to come on and talk about the actual underlying science and R&D of what they're doing. As always, if you enjoy the content on this podcast that I'm providing, uh, please like, share, and subscribe. You can give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can watch and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want to look at the video version. And you can also subscribe to my Substack, mindandmatter.substack.com. There's both a free version with uh, different content, including a free weekly newsletter of updates and other content, and a paid version, which is just five bucks a month or $50 per year. And I really appreciate that. That does help me uh, keep the podcast going and growing. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. So with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Christopher Weichart. Dr. Chris Weichart, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you start by just telling everyone who you are, what your background is, and and what you're doing professionally? Yes, I'm uh, Chris Weichart. I'm the chief scientist at SAO2 Material Science, and uh, basically I work for a company that uh, manufactures primary containers, things like vials, syringes, and uh, cartridges. Um, for uh, liquid injectable drug products. Interesting. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today has to do with the vials that you're making, and in particular, the vials that you're making for some of the COVID vaccines that are in wide circulation right now. So you said the company is SIO2 in your materials science company. So yes. can you give us an overview on what exactly materials science is? Yeah, the name of the company may be a bit strange. So maybe we just start with the SAO2 piece. Um, SAO2 is actually a, a chemical formula for um, silicon dioxide, which is a key ingredient of glass. Um, so we, uh, we are a material science company, meaning that we develop products um, utilizing material science um, as, a, as a scientific field. Um, so we are very good at understanding how materials um, uh, how to manufacture materials uh, and make them work for um, for packaging of, of as I said, uh, drug products, in particular biologic drugs. Um, we use uh, a polymer container and then we put a microscopic layer of a glassy-like material on the inside, which is this SAO2 component. So my understanding is 
you know, historically, there's been a lot of different use cases for different types of materials for things like um, liquid injectables and just to store medicines in. So at a very high level, you could have uh, a vial or packaging that's made out of pl- some kind of plastic polymer, and then you can have things that are made out of glass. So before we get into the specifics of what you guys have innovated and exactly how you are manufacturing the vials that we're going to talk about, can you give us maybe maybe a historical synopsis on how drug packaging has sort of evolved in your lifetime mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the extent to which plastics versus glass tend to be used? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, so um, you know, glass has been used for for a very long time. I mean, for for certainly for hundreds of years, and uh, more more recently, um, uh, is is used predominantly in the packaging of of drug products and particularly liquid uh, injectable drugs. Um, and um, it's certainly been the the material of choice um, uh, in 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 the form of vials and, and syringes and so forth. Plastics being a more a newer material, of course, it was invented at the dawn of, of uh, World War II and, and, um, and it has since penetrated many markets, but it really is not a, 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 a good material uh, in itself um, uh, for packaging these types of drugs. So glass, again, just historically, uh, people think it, uh, it's, it's inert, it's a pretty strong material um, and uh, has been used a long time. So therefore they, they use it now. Drug products have evolved a lot um, over the years. And more recently, you hear more about uh, a class of drugs called biologics. Um, these are drugs um, that are actually derived from uh, living cells. Um, uh, so they have cells will produce things like proteins and peptides, and those are harvested and injected into folks to treat a lot of different diseases. And what they find is these more complex drugs um, that have evolved over, over the course of decades um, have special packaging needs and uh, glass, probably not the best material. Um, even plastic uh, alone is not the best material. The reason why is because uh, glass, for instance, can break. Uh, it can leach uh, materials into the drug product and, and certainly even plastics can. They're not ultimately a very clean product. So what we've done is we've kind of uh, invented a new hybrid material that takes advantage of the, the advantages of glass and the advantages of plastic and infuse those together into a new product uh, without the, those materials disadvantages. And so we basically sell a, a, a product that's ready to fill. It's clean, sterile, um, gets rid of any leachables or, or anything that can t- contaminate the drug product, which you'd commonly find in both glass and plastic. Um, and it's unbreakable. It's it's tough, resilient, um, and can can stand the test of time. So um, that's what our products are about, and um, it's it's really a revolutionary type of uh, packaging, and and we've been uh, promoting it for for about the past ten years. So the company started in 2011, and uh, we spent a good deal of that time um, developing the product. Uh, I'd say about half that time was uh, a lot of R and D uh, investment, and uh, and now we're in a, in a very much in a commercial stage and selling our product to a variety of customers. I see. So, so if I'm understanding the, the driving force for, for why you guys started and why you guys wanted to build this kind of hybrid container was that as biologics became more and more common, more widely used, there was greater need for this type of product because this material um, can be contaminated by things leach- leaching through something that's only made of glass or plastic. And, and those things just don't contain biologics in the way that, that ideally you need them. Yeah, I, I think it really boils down to um, managing the stability of, of these new drug products. As I said, they're ultimately very sensitive. Uh, they have special needs. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly there are a lot of drugs that are packaged in glass today. Uh, the, the, dom- the market is dominated by it. Um, and there have been improvements. I, I'd say there's step change improvements in glass to try to take a band-aid approach to solving a lot of these problems. But ultimately, you still have to deal with them. And uh, what we do is we offer something new that basically eliminates a lot of these issues, as I said, breakage, uh, leachables uh, into the drug formulation. Um, and uh, I think that's what's unique about us. Now, the, the, the industry has been entrenched with glass for so long. They're 
they're pretty uh, pretty you know resi resistant to change. And uh, when you've, you invest a lot of time and, and, and money and effort in, uh, in installing glass into your, your packaging, um, you, can, you can understand why they're resistant to change. So um, ordinarily, we, uh, it's very difficult to transition existing drug, uh, especially if it's a blockbuster drug that's a you know, billion dollars investment over to a new package because there's always, obviously risks associated with that. Um, so um, we've been focusing a lot of uh, a lot of our efforts on uh, early phase development drugs. Um, these are in phase one or phase two clinical trials, uh, where a company would be more receptive to introducing a new package um, mm -hmm. like own. And uh, it's a lot easier to make those sorts of transitions. I think a good example of that would be um, some of the uh, the COVID. COVID-19 vaccines uh, that have more recently been introduced to the, to the marketplace. And of course, we're, we're selling into that market uh, as, as, as we, we stand today, particularly for Moderna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about some of that stuff. Before we get there, um, I, I would love to understand the, the process, like how you guys actually uh, build these hybrid products. I think sure. maybe a good lead into that could be, if you just describe for us, you know, to someone who doesn't know anything about this, which includes myself, basically, what at the molecular level, what is just regular old glass and how is it made? And how does that differ from what plastic is and how it's made? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, your, your ordinary glass um, that, that most of us come in contact with um, is not what they're using for, uh, for packaging these drugs. So, the, the class of glass or the materials that of glass that are used is, is what's called oral silicate. Okay. So uh, that's something that actually was invented um, in around 1880, believe it or not, by, uh, by shot glass. And um, that's been used for a lot of different things, including um, packaging of, of drug products. Um, and uh, it has basically silica, the SO2 that's in our company name, and a bunch of other what I call metal oxides, uh, things like boron, oral silicate, obviously is the name of it, uh, and, and other metal oxides that help you process the glass, um, makes it a little more resistant to the things you put in the glass because glass can leach things into the contents. Um, and uh, basically, boral silicate is again has been that sort of mainstay material in the industry. Um, uh, what we do is obviously very, very different. Um, we're molding a plastic container and then we're putting a microscopic layer of a glass-like material on the inside uh, of, of our containers, uh, which is completely different from what's done today um, with, uh, with glass vials and syringes. Yeah. Can you go into a little bit more detail on, on the process for, for making this here and, and really kind of unpack for us what... Uh, what level of resolution are we talking about here? So when, yeah. when you talk about putting these coats on plastic, how, sure. how thick are these layers and, and what is the, the nitty gritty in terms of how that's made? Yeah, so we would start off with, um, with a polymer and, and that's, of course, molded into um, the various vials, syringes and so on. It's not, a, not, a, not too different than uh, the process that's used to mold like your beverage container for, uh, for various colas and water, um, a, a similar process that's used. Um, we do use a, um, a polymer that is a medical grade, so it's a very clean resin. Um, it's basically highly transparent. I mean, if you put our vial next to a glass vial um, with the untrained eye, it'd be very difficult to tell the difference, so they look very similar. Uh, given it's a polymer, it's about half the weight of a normal glass vial. And then, of course, after the, the, the vial is made or the syringe, we put this, as you said, this microscopic layer on the inside. And we use a technology that actually is more similar to um, the uh, manufacturing of microelectronic devices. So um, microchips, the, all the, the, the processors that are in your computer and your iPhone and, and other electronics, uh, we use a process that's very similar to that to put down this microscopic layer. Um, the layer it's, is, itself is actually made of three layers. In, in totality, it's about 800 times to 1,000 times thinner than a human hair. Um, hmm. And so it's very, very thin. You cannot see it, uh, as I said, microscopic. So um, uh, you need some, some, 
some very sophisticated techniques to analyze it, ensure it's there, um, and to uh, make sure that every single vial and syringe or whatever we're making, uh, it, it, you know, it's it's present and it does its job. Um, so the process is is kind of it's referred to as a plasma. So we think of like uh, the, the various phases of, um, of of materials around us. We think of solids. We think of liquids. We think of gases and there's always that fourth state that we don't think about too much about. It's called plasma. We use actually utilize plasmas to put down these very, very thin microscopic layers on the inside of the container. It basically lines uh, the inside of the container to protect the drug product from plastic. Uh, it's ultra pure. It's it's obviously very, very thin. Um, and uh, it's highly inert, far more inert than ordinary glass. Hmm. So but you're basically painting an extremely thin layer of glass onto a plastic vial. Presumably the reason that you use the plastic vial at all is because it's easily moldable and makeable. But then this mm-hmm. thin layer of glass um, is super thin, but also super strong. And it's basically, when you say it's inert, you just mean there's no sort of chemical reaction that's going to happen between the biologic that you're putting inside the vial and the actual glass layer itself. And then also nothing can leach in from the outside. You, you got it. I mean, you, you really you summarize that very well. I mean, so the, the polymer, um, just take the polymer. Why do we use it? Um, I told you it was medical grade. I, I told you it was very clean, but it's really, really tough. Um, it can take a ton of abuse, far more than glass can. Mm. Now, glass is a, is a strong material, but when you mold it into things like vials and syringes, Um, uh, there's always defects and those defects can lead to breakage. It's quite common, uh, more common than we think it can, uh, if, you know, for instance, if you, uh, were to break one single vial, uh, or even a syringe for a drug, that's, uh, maybe a thousand dollars per dose, not uncommon for these, uh, these biologic drugs can be quite expensive. Um, you, you obviously don't want it to break. So our, our vials and syringes can take a tremendous amount of abuse and that's where the polymer comes in. And uh, because it's a polymer, it, 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 this, most polymers uh, have additives in them and you don't want those additives uh, contaminating the drug. So this is where the coating comes in. Um, the coating is, I said, as you said, highly inert, uh, doesn't contaminate the drug product, uh, more, more inert uh, than uh, most other materials that you might come in contact with. Um, very, very resilient, very tough. It can take the kind of abuse that the vial is going to see, even though it's very, very thin. And we've engineered it in a way um, such that it minimizes any interaction with that drug product, the active ingredient in there that the patient's going to see. You don't want to lose any of it. You don't want any of it sticking to the side of the mm-hmm. vial. You don't want it to uh, turn into a ball of, of, of what we call aggregates can be very common in glass. All of those things are eliminated um, by, by, by the, the, the coating that we put on the inside. And this is where material science comes in. I mean, material science is basically the study of materials and leveraging their advantages um, by combining them in different ways. And that's, that's basically what we've done uh, by uh, basically engineering it with the right composition, the right chemistry, and the right thickness um, to protect and preserve the drug product. Yeah, and and you mentioned that you were working with some of the, or your vials are used to um, as containers for some of the new mRNA vaccines that are used for COVID. My understanding with those, so A, I mean, that's a biologic. It's a lipid encapsulated mRNA molecule that's that's going to be in the vial. My understanding too is that those need to be stored at very cold temperatures, and I wonder if that's relevant here in terms of how these vials would uh, hold up at such a cold temperature compared to traditional glass. Yeah, there, there's there's interesting challenges there because the temperatures are are so cold. Um, you know, for instance, the uh, the Moderna uh, vaccine. Uh, I think initially they they required it to be stored at minus twenty degrees Celsius. I mean that's that's really really cold. Uh, Pfizer required it initially to be stored at minus seventy. I mean that's hmm. it's even colder, right? So, and then there's there's other therapies that even require even colder temperatures, down to cryogenic temperatures, which can reach you know minus one eighty. I mean, it seems extreme, but really the, the whole idea there is again to preserve it so that it can be uh, then reconstituted and then injected into a patient. 
Um, so the problem with glass um, when it comes to those temperatures is remember, you, not only do you have a vial, a glass container vial, you also have this rubber stopper that has to be inserted into the, uh, to the top of that vial. And as the temperature drops, those two materials, this rubber, rubbery material and this glass material, very, very different. And what ends up happening to the rubber is it actually starts to harden and it starts to shrink. And glass and rubber shrink at different rates. So mm -hmm. it's quite possible that you could get a leak. It, it can't happen if they're not matched appropriately. Um, and um, it, it's, it's an issue that they have to deal with. Um, it's not an issue with our vial because you have a polymer and you have a rubber material. They're very similar in some ways. So they shrink at, at the same rates. Um, they're better matched in terms of sealing. And so your propensity for leakage is far reduced. Also, the propensity for breakage at these temperatures um, can, be, can be higher for glass than, than for our polymer. So there's, there's quite a few advantages that we can uh, leverage and, uh, in our product to showcase uh, to our customers and, and Moderna being one of them. So how long does it take you to make a vial compared to a normal glass vial? Yeah, um, our, our lines are, are capable um, of very, very uh, fast uh, throughput. Um, I can just tell you, so about, you know, before uh, the, the COVID um, pandemic came along, we were producing probably on the order of about 10 million vials a year or 10 million of, of various container size vials a year. Wow. Um, once uh, we were very fortunate to get uh, some government funded money um, through Operation Warp Speed, uh, we got about $143 million. That was for expanding our capacity uh, in Auburn, Alabama, where we're located. Um, we basically went from 10 million vials a year to 10 million vials a month. Hmm. Um, and that was because of um, our ability to expand production capacity. So um, in terms of comparison, uh, you know, our throughput, I mean, uh, it's really unlimited. I mean, it's, you know, obviously you need money to build additional capacity. Um, but, uh, but we have very, very fast throughput uh, machines that mold, coat. Uh, package them. And then the only thing we don't do on site is the sterilization. Um, we send that out to a third party to be sterilized. Um, and that's one thing we haven't mentioned is, is the ability to fill uh, our, our, our containers um, because they already, they already are sterile. Uh, glass typically is manufactured dirty. I, not like they intend to do that. But before it's, it's, it's a dirty product that has to be sterilized and washed before it can be used on a line uh, for fill and finish. Our, ours is ready to use when we call it RTU, ready to use, uh, because it is already, already sterile and ready to fill with the drug product. I see. So you mentioned uh, Moderna was using your vials. So, so basically, are you selling directly to like the vaccine uh, manufacturer or, or the drug company themselves? And they're just ordering, you know, one or five or 10 million vials. And then that gets shipped to be sterilized. And then it goes to them to be filled. Is that like the order of operations? Yeah. So, I mean, so Moderna, just to be clear, Moderna has multiple suppliers. We mm. one of them. Um, I think the demand, uh, obviously, for uh, so many of these uh, vials, um, you know, and our ability to expand our production capabilities, it certainly exceeded their, their, their needs. So, so um, they, they have multiple vendors, no question about it. But um, so what, they're the ones that procure them from us. Um, we ship them not to Moderna, um, where they make the vaccine, but we ship it to their, what they call their CMO or their contract manufacturing organization. This would be the, um, the company that would do the fill finish. So that's what we ship directly to them. Uh, and they are the ones that do the filling and the finishing and the capping and the labeling of the product before it goes out. Um, so while Moderna purchases it from us, we don't ship directly to them. We send it to what they call their CMO. Mm -hmm. Now, as a more general uh, question here, you know, everyone uh, in almost any business that you might be in, or even just ordinary people, have felt in some way the effects of a lot of the supply chain supply chain shocks that we've experienced in the last couple of years. Is there uh, 
have you guys or other glass companies experienced any of that in terms of getting your raw materials? What's been, uh, what have been the constraints there? Has anything slowed you down the last two years? You know, it, it really hasn't. Um, and of course, there has been um, a shortage of glass um, for the glass industry. Um, this has been reported on uh, for quite some time, time now. And, and it's been, it certainly hindered glass companies' ability to fulfill the demand for folks like Pfizer and, and Moderna. Um, and, and of course, you still have this, this growing biologic uh, drug um, market that uh, continues to grow. Um, so we, we have actually zero ties to any sort of glass raw materials. And I know it seems a bit odd um, because we, we do put down a material that is, that is like glass. But our, so obviously, we, as I said, we start off with a polymer. So that's obviously not glass. The glassy material that goes down on every vial and syringe um, is more closely tied again to the microelectronics industry. Um, they actually use um, liquids um, that ends, ends up becoming a, a, a gas in a process and convert it into a solid as a glass-like material. We, we use uh, the same raw materials as, um, as say, a, a manufacturer of uh, the microchips that are in the computer. Or mm. And what is that? Like, what is the uh, molecular formula of this material? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's referred to as an organosilane. Um, and uh, as I said, you can buy it from a number of different manufacturers. You gotta, have to remember, uh, you know, the amount of material that goes down on each and every vial and, and syringe. Um, we, we said it was a, on a microscopic scale. Um, so let's just take one vial, for instance. Um, our typical vial may be only six grams, okay, in total after it's coated. About 400 micrograms of that is coating. So raw materials for the coating are minuscule hmm. compared to the vial itself. So as I said, completely no ties to the glass industry um, in terms of raw materials and no problem with gaining access to those uh, for our manufacturing our vials. So it hasn't been a hindrance whatsoever. Interesting. Okay. So, so you're basically not slowed down by anything in part because these layers of material are so small that you've probably just got some enormous, relatively enormous stockpile that's going to last you a very long time. That's right. That's right. You'd be surprised. We have a basically a, a small canister of that uh, connected to one of our manufacturing lines. It's everybody looks at it like, wow, that's that's not very much. But if you think again about how much material actually goes down, a little goes a long way in our products, and mm -hmm. uh, we, we certainly take advantage of that. So um, is, this, is this the only thing you guys make? Are, are you specialized for like vaccine vials? No, not really. Actually, our, as I said before, our, our focus previously was on a variety of different bi um, biologic drugs um, that were completely uh, outside the realm of, of this, this vaccine market. Um, only because of the pandemic did we shift our focus over to this. Uh, but we do uh, make a, a, a bunch of other products um, for, uh, you know, as you said, a variety of different uh, of uh, biologic drugs. But we also have, um, interestingly enough, a baby bottle that takes care and basically takes advantage of, of this same technology. It's uh, um, sort of, a, a you know, again, a lot of mothers don't want their baby's milk in contact with, uh, with a polymer. There's uh, certainly some negative connotations of things leaching into the baby's milk. So we, we do sell a, uh, a baby bottle product. We have um, a line of, um, of products for the laboratory, um, for instance, um, blood collection tubes, again, leveraging the same technology, um, uh, aligned uh, polymeric blood collection tube. So you don't want you know, anything getting into uh, the blood that's, uh, that's, that's pulled into the tube. And, and many other things, micro titer plates, uh, uh, collection tubes of, of various sorts for the laboratory. How, um, I mean, I really know nothing about this area. So when we're thinking about pl like everyday plastics that would be used in something like a baby bottle or just, you know, I've got a, I've got a cup here that's made out of some kind of plastic. Mm -hmm. What is, can you give us a sense for like what the actual risk level is in terms of things leaching out, like the polymer polymers actually coming off into the liquid you might be drinking or stuff coming through from the outside? Is that, 
is that a major issue or is it a sort of a rare occurrence? Well, I mean, I certainly the FDA regulates um, this for foods and beverages. So I think the risk profile there is, is quite low. Um, but there certainly is the perception. Um, I just use baby bottles as an example. Um, uh, and there certainly have been um, reports of things in baby bottles that are not good for for the baby. I mean, and, and I, I, I'm certainly not here to claim that's uh, true or false, but certainly the perception is reality for, for a lot of folks. And um, we, we basically serve that. We can provide a product that can be certain that nothing contaminates that milk, whether it's harmful or not. Um, I cannot say, but I can certainly assure that there's nothing getting into that milk. Um, and that gives uh, mothers, uh, a, you know, certainly a level of confidence uh, in our products, reason why they buy our product. Um, and that's something new that we just recently introduced last year, again, leveraging that same technology. I mean, for drugs, it's a little bit different. And I think the risk profile there is much, much higher because if you alter that drug, as I said, these biologics are very complex. Um, they can result in um, in bad things, and uh, you know, for instance, could solicit an immune response in a patient. You got to remember, you're injecting these directly into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. um, if the drug uh, is not in a state to help the patient, uh, it can be perceived by the body as a foreign invader, and it can trigger an immune response. Anything from anaphylactic shock to a rash, and even potentially death. Now, the risks are, are on the low end, but I mean, if it's your mom or your sister or your brother, or I mean, you, what do you want? I, I, you know, you're you going to want to go with something that's not going to have that kind of risk profile. Um, the drug pump com companies obviously manage that risk, um, but we obviously can uh, reduce that risk burden much, much lower than standard packaging. I see. Um so you mentioned that like a company like Moderna has multiple uh, suppliers of the vials that are using. So some of, you know, if, if, you know, if, if a million people that got the Moderna vaccine uh, were, were, you were talking to them, uh, some fraction of them would have had one that was stored in one of your vials. Some mm -hmm. fraction of them would have had one stored in another kind of vial that was maybe more standard medical glass and so on and so forth. I mean, is it conceivable that there would be different rates of contamination for the same exact vaccine in this case, based on what it was actually stored in? Yeah, I mean, certainly the uh, there would be differences. Um, Moderna, obviously, uh, getting uh, some some glass products, I, I know, and there's been, you know, public uh, disclosures on a corning glass supplying a, a new type of glass, um, a new glass that, you know, lo lowers the, the leachables bird, meaning the le you know, less contamination into uh, the product. Um, um, so, but, but it still breaks, you know, it still has other issues. Um, as I said before, our product does eliminate a lot of those issues. Um, so there are some new products coming online, the new materials, but I, as I said before, they're more of a band-aid approach in my opinion. They're, they're really not eliminating these types of problems. But again, you know, I think for Moderna and Pfizer, the demand, um, is just so high at this point in time that they're, they're pulling uh, products from various locations. I think once this uh, supply chain issue settles down, they're gonna have to choose or decide upon a, a, a given platform. And we certainly think we offer the best product um, for, for, their, uh, for their vaccine and certainly hope that they'll uh, choose us uh, for, for anything they develop in the future. And we gotta remember before the pandemic came along, they, were, they weren't even focused on on COVID, they had a whole mm -hmm. line of very interesting and innovative drug products based on this uh, mRNA uh, technology. Uh, very exciting stuff. Um, all of their attention, obviously, is 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 it is on this uh, this vaccine for COVID. But I think it's going to swing the other way. Um, and again, you're going to need uh, new innovative packaging, um, and I think we provide that. Yeah. Um I'd be interested to know, so if I think back to when I was in college, I didn't study material science, but I remember it was something that you could major in. And I think mm -hmm. it, you know, it was relatively new at the time. For those people who are listening that are unfamiliar, especially people that may be students or 
might become college students in the near future. Can you talk about what material science is in terms of what what, what basic uh, scientific disciplines do you learn about to to become a material scientist? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, you can uh, certainly major in material science and engineering. There's a lot of uh, schools that offer this uh, at, at major universities across across the uh, country and, and in the world. But um, basically, as I said, it, uh, it's basically a study of materials and uh, understanding their um, their chemistry. So you, you, chemistry is, is obviously a, um, a discipline that can be leveraged here, uh, not just on the molecular level, um, but, but also at, 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 a, at a higher level. And then there's um, the, um, the, the physical um, properties of materials. You know, how do they uh, interact with other materials? Uh, in our case, it's drugs. Um, how do they handle abuse? Um, how do they handle temperature cycling? Um, if you put a chemical inside of them, how do they interact? Um, so there's certainly um, some physics, there's chemistry, certainly math, and engineering. So, and, and that's really where problem solving comes in. How do you invent a better package? Um, and, uh, and what should that look like? And as I said, I go back to um, you know, really understanding the advantages of glass and, uh, and, and the advantages of plastics. And they both, they both have clear advantages and they've been leveraged for uh, decades for all kinds of things that surround us in everyday life. So how do you, how do you, how do you combine those advantages and, uh, and, but, but not uh, have the disadvantages? And that's where you have to understand a little bit about uh, engineering. How do you combine materials that ordinarily shouldn't be combined or, 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 or aren't ordinarily combined into a product? Um, so problem solving and, uh, and bringing engineering to solve those problems using chemistry, physics, and mathematics are key. Um, and um, there's a whole field of science um, around various materials, polymers being one of them. So polymer science, we bring to bear here. And then uh, a whole field of, of uh, material science in what we call thin film technology. So as I said, everything from what's in your microprocessors to... Uh, coatings that go on, uh, say so anti-reflective coatings that go on your glasses, or uh, coatings that go on windows for uh, for reflecting light. Um, all of that science is leveraged in the microscopic layer that we put down on each and every container. So a lot of a lot of disciplines uh, have been brought to bear uh, in studying materials and again exploiting their benefits. Interesting. Yeah. So it's really sort of a material science. I think it's fair to say is applied math, physics, and chemistry. And then, of course, in many cases, there's a component of biology there as well, because you have to understand what you're actually putting in into these materials. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's a component that's, um, uh, it's a little more difficult, because of course, when you're working with some of these uh, drug companies, they're not going to tell you basically their secret sauce, um, mm -hmm. if you or their secret recipe. Um, but they'll maybe give you some idea of, of what uh, sort of we, we certainly know a lot of these drugs are based on proteins and peptides and amino acids that are assembled together in different ways, um, but they're not going to tell you exactly. And in some cases, they can't tell you exactly because these molecules are so complex. But, but yeah, certainly understanding the biological significance of these drug products and how they uh, interact uh, in a formulation can really help understand how they're going to behave in your package. Um, so there's some surface science and some interfacial science, as we call it, of how uh, a surface will interact with a drug formulation. Um, you don't have to think about that too much for some of the uh, less complex drugs, but in the field of biologics, it's very, very important uh, to understand that. I see. So, so is it true that you know, for, for biologics, for things like um, vaccines, Mm -hmm. that there's not necessarily like one material that would be ideal for all biologics that, that you might put into these things. You might, uh, in theory, you want to like customize it to each thing. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think for the vast majority of products we've encountered, um, you know, our, our product has been just fine, but there have been specific, some specific cases where we've actually had to engineer the surface of our coding um, to say minimize interactions. Some drugs, um, are, are, are quite different and they do interact uh, in ways you wouldn't expect. But 
um, we can change the surface of the container to minimize those interactions. It's one of the uh, advantages of our technology um, that we can, as I said, bring some uh, surface engineering to bear um, to, to minimize anything that, that might uh, cause damage or, or change the drug product. That has been a small percentage of, uh, of the products that we've encountered, um, but still significant. And uh, maybe in the difference of, of uh, introducing a drug to the, drug, to, the, uh, to the marketplace or not. Um, and uh, in some few cases, we've been able to showcase those advantages to our customers. Hmm. I imagine um, like on your team, you've got different kinds of scientists doing different kinds of things. Can you give us a sense for like, what are some of the key scientific roles and, and what are those people doing? How much of it is, you know, intellectual work versus, um, you know, actual hands-on work to say, build, build some device that's part of your uh, manufacturing chain? Yeah. So, I mean, that's changed quite a bit over the years we've been around. I mean, initially it was, um, a lot of focus around research and development. Um, and uh, so there was obviously um, a, a lot of bench, what I call bench top work, um, understanding, you know, what are these processes going to look like? Uh, you know, bring, again, utilizing material science to understand what is our product ultimately gonna look like and, and how does it address all of these problems uh, with, uh, with current packaging. Okay, so first four or five years, a lot of research development to um, understand what the product's gonna look like, what, what the manufacturing process might look like. Then the next five or so years, we brought a lot of more engineering to bear <clears throat> to scale up uh, the, uh, the process because you know, initially we were coding, you know, day one we were, we were coding and manufacturing bottles, you know, two bottles at a time, then 10 bottles at a time, you know. And then of course, obviously, how do you mass produce that um, with millions of containers utilizing a technology that uh, uh, may not uh, seem very obvious how you would, you would scale that up, right? I mean, so uh, uh, today I think the, um, the workforce has changed from the standpoint of we have a lot of, of folks fixing problems um, that were specific to uh, the drug industry. Um, and then later on, it was more about how do you fix problems for scale up and mass production. Um, so we do have a lot of um, engineering uh, folks um, with in the areas of mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, um, automation, because a lot of our manufacturing has a ton of automation. Um, this is, or the, these are in clean room environments, so you want to keep manufacturing uh, free of particulates. It needs to be sterile. Um, and we do have a, a lot of uh, robots. So automation engineering and programmers that have to be brought to bear um, to uh, eliminate human contact with, with our products um, to, to keep it sterile. So uh, yeah, it, it's interesting how a company uh, first starts because I, I was literally employee number six and, hmm. uh, and now we're, we have a, a company of 500. So again, the, the company evolves and you have to change the workforce accordingly. Um, to uh, to address what stage you're in in, in commercializing the product, mm -hmm. but you have a lot of people that basically, um, you know, if they have a college degree, they probably studied something like engineering or something like physics. Yep. Yeah. 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 I, as I said, I think the majority of folks that are uh, working in our production areas and um, and that the equipment have engineering degrees. As I said, you know, mechanical engineering being one of them, computer engineering being another, industrial engineering and another, chemical engineering um, on more of the uh, on the coding side. Um, but uh, but all of those disciplines uh, are brought to bear. We do have a lot of molding engineers. Um, they have they maybe have uh, their sort of their bread and butter is mechanical engineering, but they specialize in how to mold polymers into containers. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a whole discipline around that as well. How did you actually get involved with this company? Was this something that you expected to happen or, or what was sort of your origin story with respect to getting into this line of business? Yeah. I, um, so I originally um, I worked at the Dow Chemical Company in mm -hmm. uh, Midland, Michigan for about uh, 11 years. Um, this certainly was not on my radar. Um, what happened actually was one of my uh, former bosses at Dow had retired uh, and left the company and uh, got in touch with me 
uh, because he was consulting for uh, a company down here in Auburn, Alabama. And they had this idea of starting a brand new business uh, centered around a new and innovative packaging for, for drug products. And of course, the, you know, the focus being on biologic drugs. Um, I certainly was not looking at that time. I, I couldn't even tell you where Auburn, Alabama was on the map. <laughs> so, so that, that had to be figured out first, but, uh, but I came down and I, I really, uh, I really liked sort of their vision of what they wanted to create. Um, at Dow, I was, I was part of core R and D. So I got, a, I got to be involved in a lot of new products, but never really saw it to the very end, um, which is exciting itself, but sort of, you know, you, you'd love to see something, you know, be a part of that path to developing something all the way through to commercialization and sale. And that, and that was an opportunity for me to be a part of that, that journey um, from early conception uh, all the way to, to commercialization. So I think that really excited me um, that I could be a part of that process and uh, that journey. Um, there was a very strong connection with the Dow, connection, a Dow Chemical Company uh, from a consulting standpoint. Um, so I knew uh, a few of the individuals that were consulting with our owner, uh, Bobby Abrams, and uh, and they were all obviously part of the decision making process for me to make that jump down here to something completely new and different with a company that only had five employees. So um, I had to do a little bit of uh, you know understanding of what I was getting into before I made the journey, but I, I certainly don't regret it. It's been a it's been a great ride, and I continue to. Uh, to see new applications for this technology. And, and I'm certainly part of that, uh, that journey. Hmm. Another thing I'm interested in is, so you mentioned that you got, you guys got government funding as part of the larger operation warp speed effort around just vaccine, you know, va- scaling up vaccine production in, mm-hmm. in every way that we need it right now. How does, um, I'm curious about how that actually works. So like I work in the private sector and we have investors who, you know, give the company money because they expect there to be growth and they'll get a financial return. How does, um, how does the relationship with the government work here in terms of how, how they determine um, who to give money, how much to give? And if they're, they're not investors in the same way that you would get at a, at a startup, you know, getting money from investors. So how are they measuring like their return here and what does that actually mean for the government? Yeah, yeah. So obviously, we were one of many uh, companies that received uh, funds to expand production um, to assist with the uh, the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So, you know, basically, we worked through um, an organization called BARDA, um, and they were the ones uh, that we had contacted and, uh, you know, basically submitted a, a proposal that we could certainly assist in uh in in the production of of containers for for the vaccine itself so there there was money allocated obviously to companies developing the vaccine uh those that were packaging the the vaccine and and, and other entities as well um so i think for the government you know they wanted to obviously um assist in in any way they could this is actually grant money so it's not money that requires repayment it's it's Mm -hmm. as you said it's different from investment um, from, or from an inv- investor um, putting dollars in, um, but it went all straight to capital investment machines to build uh, equipment that will ultimately manufacture um, these uh, these containers, and also, of course, the buildings and and, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, we we initially got 143 million dollars for the expansion. Um, uh, and then just uh, earlier this year, we got another $63 million, again, for additional expansion and capacity, um, again, all to address the, the, the demand for these containers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is a different relationship, yeah. obviously, than an investor. I mean, it's, com- it's completely different. Yeah. Uh, they do come in and they do audit us. We have to report to them on a quarterly basis on how we're doing and how we're uh, you know, achieving our objectives and our goals. Um, I see. So there's like the, checkpoints built in, in terms of uh, if you get like a, I mean, do they give it to you all at once or are there different tranches of money? And like, as long as you're sort of hitting, hitting your goals, it, it keeps coming in. Yeah. You, there's milestones that you have to achieve. Uh, and, and of course there's a lot of oversight uh, from the government to make sure that those are being met. So we, we meet them regularly and, uh, and obviously address uh, any concerns that are, that are needed uh 
to be uh, to be ironed out. And then, um, yeah, the money comes in in increments. And uh, and of course, as it comes in, we we you know just continually focus on expanding our capacity. As I said, you know, going from 10 million vials a year to 10 million vials a month uh, is is a huge expansion effort. So it, it requires not just capital buildings but people i mean we went from literally 200 to you know basically doubled our uh, our our folks here at, at our auburn alabama facility uh, which you know is is a feat unto itself in uh in certainly less than less than six months that we did that how big is the facility yeah our, our manufacturing uh facility is about uh 300 000 square feet that includes, uh, you know, obviously office space, but uh, the, the majority of that is manufacturing space. Uh, these are clean rooms um, that uh, you know maintain, a, as I said, a sterile but clean environment for all the all the products that we make. Uh, very different from a glass manufacturing facility uh, in terms of cleanliness and sterility. Mm-hmm. And is are there any um, I don't know are there any like interesting R and D projects that you can talk about? Um, anything that you know, you're not you're not fully building and selling yet, but any new yeah. kinds of materials for new kinds of applications? Yeah, no, absolutely. We're um, certainly focused uh, in, in quite a few different areas. A couple of which I could comment on would be on the cell and gene therapy markets. These are this is an emerging area, very exciting um, cell and gene therapies uh, to address some from really tough diseases um, that are that are out there. These a lot of these are, are obviously going through clinical trials today. Um, these particular um, class of biologics um, has very cold temperature requirements, some down as low as minus 180 degrees Celsius. Um, that's uh, very, very cold. That's like minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. So I, you know, but again, because they're so sensitive, they, they require storage at those temperatures. Our, our packaging being a, a great, uh, uh, you know, uh, candidate for those types of packaging. So we've been heavily invested in, and, uh, and working with customers developing these new therapies. Um, also in the, uh, the area of, of freeze-dried uh, drugs, uh, a lot of times f- uh, drugs are freeze dried again because they're just not stable at room temperature or even frozen. Um, this is a freeze dry process where you freeze it, but you remove all the moisture that's in the product. Very different than just freezing it. Again, all about just preserving stability. Um, and actually, some of the uh, some of the uh, drug company or the vaccine makers like Moderna and Pfizer are looking at ways of of freeze drying their vaccines to pre- preserve it for longer periods of time. Um, so we have um, a line of, of uh, vials that are ideal for freeze drying drugs. Um, and uh, we've been promoting that as well. So those are just a cu- couple of the areas that we've been focusing our efforts on. Interesting. Um, do you have any recommendations on any resources or sort of general areas that people would look into if they were interested in studying material science or, or getting started in that direction? Yeah, yeah, certainly there's uh, a number of different, um, as I said, universities that specialize in this. Um, I'm not going not gonna to mention those by name, but I mean, I certainly you can get online and find, uh, you know, universities that specialize in, in material science and engineering as, as a as a field of discipline. Um, there are certainly a, a lot of journals, um, some of which we publish in. Um, uh, we do publish uh, certainly in, in um, through Parental Drug Association. Now this is specifically for drug products, including liquid injectables and biologics, but there's a lot of material science that are brought to bear in the packaging area. And, and so we publish in that area. Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences is another area. We're obviously focusing on on the uh, the uh, fields of science that are specific to drug products, but certainly a lot of material science uh, articles that are in those journals. Um, and you know, you know, I think if um, uh, if, you, if you come to visit our facility, you'll you'll get a, a certain a lesson in material science. Um, we we do offer tours here. Um, and be happy to entertain folks that like to see our facilities and uh, understand our products and and how we leverage material science to make our products. 
Interesting. Well, this is a, a fascinating area that I didn't expect to, to actually learn this much about, um, but it's obviously very important given given the times that we're in. Is there anything else you want to speak about before I let you go, Chris, um, that has to do with what you guys are doing uh, with respect to these vials? No, I, it's, it's really, uh, really a pleasure to share about uh, you know what, are, what we're doing as a company and uh, some of the new things that we're working on. But as I said, right now is uh, our, our main attention is is on the uh, the vaccine uh, for COVID, and uh, but at, at the same time, you know, addressing a lot of new drug products that are coming through the pipeline. And I, I've just you know biological sciences and these new drugs, certainly not my area of expertise, but I've certainly learned a lot over the, the 10 years I've been here. Um, and I think if I had done it all over again, I probably would have focused on, on uh, uh, molecular um, engineering of some of these drug molecules. It's, it's just so incredible, um, all the diseases that one can treat these days. And I think, you know, at some point, you're going to see a lot of these uh, common diseases and uh, disappear uh, and uh, or at least be able to be treatable so people can live their lives in a more normal way. Um, so I, I'm just so excited to be a part of that, that path uh, in providing the packaging that can enable some of these new drugs into the marketplace. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff. Do you guys have like a website or are there any like YouTube videos up that ca- that people can go to to learn more about how all this stuff works? Yeah, yeah. You can you can go to our website, um, for all, the SA2 Material Science website, um, and then we do have uh, a number of YouTube videos uh, that you can find on both uh, uh, our website as well as on LinkedIn. Um, you'll see videos, uh, not just a manufacturing process, but how we make our products and a number of uh, um, uh, videos of, of our employees, of our management, explaining um, what we're all about and what we do. And, and again, some of the advantages of our products. So, uh, yeah, I would say you know, LinkedIn, uh, as well as our, our, uh, our company webpage can explain a lot of that. All right. Well, I will link to some of that stuff in the show notes for people who are interested in interested in checking it out. Uh, But Chris Weikert, thanks for walking us through all this. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Nick. It's an absolute pleasure. 